Additional note, it is interesting to note that in the Gilgamesh epic, tab at 11, a snake steals the immortality of humanity, line 283. After which Gilgamesh laments that the, this is a, is a really weird phrase in Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh laments that the earth lion in Akkadian Neshu Shah Kakari had stolen his chance at eternal life. What in the world is going on here? Why? The story has a snake, it's Bitsuru here. And when Gilgamesh is sitting down feeling sorry for himself, he refers to this thing as an, an earth lion. Well, what the heck is that? Earth lion is the same way that Greek expresses the word for chameleon. Kamai leon. Kamai is on the ground, on the earth. Leon, lion, earth lion. That's what chameleon literally means. Noted cuneiform scholar Ake Joburg has suggested, and it's just a suggestion, but I think it's worth thinking about, it may be possible to connect the Akkadian Neshu with the Eblaite Naish, and that word with the Hebrew Nakash. Now, why do I bring this up? Because Neshu, 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 okay, Nakash. And what that leads to is the significance of this possible connection is that one would have a serpentine being in an Eden like story who was a changeling. Chameleons change their appearance, don't they? This might resonate with 1st Enoch 19.1, where the watchers were said to be able to change form, and perhaps 2nd Corinthians 11.14, this is the verse where it talks about Satan being able to tran be transformed into an angel of light. Uh, he can appear uh, as something brilliant and wonderful when he actually is not. Uh, in Egypt, Seraph, uh, Egypt actually combines the features uh, a seraph in Egypt is a, f is a shining or flaming serpent. So they, they sort of dovetail both possibilities in Egyptian literature and Egyptian iconography. So we've talked a little bit about both of these, identity, nature, fate, and possible serpentine beings elsewhere. Sons of God and the Watchers, again, by this time you should be familiar with Genesis 6. I'm not going to read this whole thing to you, but Sons of God with the Daughters of Men, bearing the Nephilim. Again, Sons of God are often called Watchers in later Jewish literature. I've uh, had these passages up before, but again, they are distinct. The Watchers come down to the earth, teach the Sons of Men, and they end up committing sins with the daughters of men because they began to mingle themselves with the daughters of men so that they might be polluted. Uh, again, we're familiar with all this. Watcher is not just a later Jewish term. It does show up in the Bible. So don't leave here and get the mistaken notion that watcher is just a, an Enochian term. It actually does show up uh, in Daniel. And it's always accompanied with the phrase holy one. So a watcher is a holy one, which you know, which means by this time in Daniel, in Israelite history and theology, you have good watchers, okay? It's, it's not, the, the point is not that they're all evil. The, the ones in Genesis 6 are viewed as evil. But here you have three examples where they're good guys. In the vision of my mind in my bed, you know, Daniel says, I saw a watcher that is a holy one coming down from heaven. This is when he's going to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And he gets, you know, it's the edict passed down, the decree passed down by the watchers as to what's going to happen. The watcher that is the holy one whom the king saw descend from the heavens, saying, so on and so forth. Here's the phrase, watcher, holy one. Daniel 4.23, sentence is decreed by the watchers. This verdict is commanded by the holy ones. This verse is really interesting because it really gives them power. Okay? The point is not that they've come up with a sentence that God doesn't know about. But the point is that they are council members, and the council has decided, in Daniel 7, you have that council meeting, that this is what's going to happen. So there's, there's some degree of participation, uh, decision-making here in the council. Uh, in the book of First Enoch and other intertestamental Jewish texts, the watchers are evil. We, we know about that. You've heard enough about that. In Second Enoch 18, the number of the fallen watchers is put at 200. That's an interesting number that we'll, we'll see later. They were sentenced to imprisonment within the earth for their corruption of human race. Again, we've seen these motifs, so I'm not going to read this whole thing for you, but they are reprimanded here.
here's the kicker. Again, one fragmentary text from Qumran for Q Amram, manuscript B, tells us that watchers had a serpentine appearance. Now the question is, what about the Anunnaki? Are any of those things associated with the Anunnaki? Is there a correlation between them and the watchers, the sons of God? The name Anunnaki, let's start here. Contrary to what Sitchin says, the word Anunnaki does not mean they who from heaven came. He's, he's in the ballpark, but he wants the came part because he has the Anunnaki as ET gods from another planet. Rather, the word means the gods on high or princely offspring or seed. Now, I'm going to show you this. Again, I, I, I try to do this because I want you to know I'm not making it up. This is the current, the most current uh, Sumerian dictionary. Unfortunately, only the first three volumes are published. This is the entry for Anunnaki. Now, Anunnaki, if, if you can make this out, generally means princely seed. Okay, and it, it's also it's used of people, you know, royal seed. So it just means, you know, the offspring of of you know, someone who's a king or kingly or royal. But it also does mean down here a group of gods, so it can mean either. But it doesn't mean they who from heaven came, i.e. in spaceships. <clears throat> Recall from the Nephilim lecture that the biblical sons of God are also the sons, sons of the Most High. Biblical sons of God are over the nations. They're called princes. Now, in their high estate, the Anunnaki acted as judges. They decree the fates. If you were here for the Panspermia lecture, I quoted Atrahasis, those who administer fates administer destinies. The Anunnaki then are divine judges. This is parallel to Psalm 82, where the sons of God were criticized for being bad judges. Same role. Okay, so there's a point of correlation. In the Babylonian primeval epic of Atrahasis, all the gods of the divine council are referred to as the sons of Anu. Now, Anu was the high god, so they're the sons of the high god, sons of the most high. Again, this is a correlation between the biblical sons of God and the Anunnaki. There are strong parallels here. As a sidebar, since the Anunnaki are the sons of Anu, the high god, they are completely divine in Mesopotamian religion. They are not hybrids. They are not the Nephilim. I don't know why, why, I do know why Sitchin does this, but it's just so, I mean, it's just a, a, a blunder. That's the only way I can describe it. I don't, he, he just wants this equation because he thinks this is, the, you know, coming down in rockets or something. Um, so he's wrong on linguistic grounds, not only, but he's also wrong in, in Mesopotamia. They're, they're completely divine. They're not, they're not hybrids, but that's a minor point. The Anunnaki, curiously enough, are demoted in Mesopotamian religion. In Mesopotamian text, you actually have conflicting descriptions of the Anunnaki. Some texts have the Anunnaki as being gods of the highest rank under Anu, they're his sons. At the very beginning of Atrahasis, they're the gods who make the other gods, the Igigi, work in forced labor. This is all the more significant when you understand, again, Mesopotamian cosmography. And Finally, what about the serpentine features? Unfortunately, there's no direct evidence that the Anunnaki were serpentine in appearance. Some Sitchin supporters use the Ubayid figurines as proof of this, and here's one of them. But unfortunately, none of these figurines have any inscriptions on them at all. We have no idea who, who the, the artist was depicting. He doesn't tell us. Uh, and there's no text that, that, that makes a serpentine connection with the Anunnaki. I think, I think what we can say with security is that it is very possible. It's very possible that, again, according to Jewish traditions, that the sons of God, the watchers, who cohabit with human women in Genesis 6 and in a whole bunch of other Jewish texts, it's possible that they could have had a serpentine appearance. We're not, we're, there's only one text that even suggests that. It's 4Q Amram, 
and it doesn't describe the Genesis 6 incident. It just says that the watcher who spoke to me looked this way. Uh, it's a weak correlation, but it nevertheless is there, so it's a possibility. And it is also possible that those beings who are condemned to inhabit the abyss and the netherworld, hell as we know it, and their offspring, the giants, the Rephaim, so on and so forth, who also wind up in hell, that they are the Anunnaki. I can't stand here and say that I, I think that correlation is tight. All I can say is that there's some analogous evidence for it.